Well, I'll say hello and welcome. I'm Greg Johnston. I'm a senior application specialist with Sensors and Software. And today I'll be talking about the Echo Project software and specifically about some of the new features that we've introduced in Echo Project version 5. Uh, that's the version that we released last month. I want to talk about the new feature called Slice View, Slice View Lines. As I said, I think that this is the new feature I'm most excited about because I think that it will have the most impact on our users. In earlier versions of Echo Project, it was necessary to have data collected in an XY grid before you could generate depth slices. Hopefully you've seen these types of images. If not, here's an example. So I'm opening up Echo Project and I'm going to open So here's some data here, and you'll notice that I've got a folder called Utilities, which is a grid. And when I depth slice through it, I can see Utilities. Okay, so I'm slicing down through the data from top to bottom, from zero down to two or three meters here. And certainly at different levels, we can see linear events, which are interpreted as being Utilities. Okay, so hopefully you've seen these types of images before. Now, despite the proven power of depth slice images to improve the detection and interpretation of subsurface objects, we hear time and time again that setting up a grid is difficult and time consuming. So many people don't do it. The only reason that grids are necessary to generate depth slices is because when data are collected in an XY grid, we know the position of every GPR trace in the area. Accurate positioning of the GPR data is the key. You can generate depth slices without a grid as long as you know the position of every GPR trace collected. So how do we do that? I'm going to show you two common ways. The first, as I'm sure many of you have guessed, is to use GPS, specifically accurate. GPS. GPS more accurate than the GPS on your smartphone or in your car. To make viable depth slices, we need a GPS that provides positioning to one meter or less. When you have a GPS to position your GPR lines accurately, that allows you to use the new Slice View Lines feature in Echo Project version 5. So let's look at a couple examples of this right now. So I'm opening up this data set. Okay, what we see here, notice from, in here we've got the, the map view window. And notice from uh, in the map view window, the GPS path is plotted. And I'm going to turn off this for a second. So you can actually see the path uh, that the user followed when they collected the data. So it's kind of like a pseudo grid pattern that covers the area in two directions. So notice that if I select the line in Project Explorer, so I'm over here, I select the line and I go up and I click on Slice View here, I do get an error message. It's telling me this is not a grid. And so if I'm going to process this and look at it as depth slices, I'm going to have to use Slice View Lines. And so there's a number of ways to get at the slice view lines. There's three ways, actually. I can use the drop-down. If you look at the little button here under slice view, there's an option called slice view lines. I can also go to the tools menu and select it from there, slice view lines under the tools menu. Or I can right-click on the name and pick it from there. So in this case, I'm just going to use the button, and I'm going to go into slice view lines. So a dialog opens up. So let's talk about the settings in this dialog. First, you need a name. You need a name of the depth slices that you are generating. And this one's going to be called Slice Set 2. Um, I might change the name. Let me change. I'm going to call it Gulf Green. So that's the name of it. Next is the processing. So you see this large area in here where all the processing is applied. And this is the processing that's applied before the depth slices are calculated. The only parameter we cannot easily default is the velocity. 
So that value is sitting there uh, using a default value of 0.1 meters per nanosecond. So we, to get the best possible depth slices, we do need the most accurate velocity that we can get. I imagine that many of you are familiar with velocity calibration by hyperbolic fitting. Use line view to go through G, the GPR line, and if you find a hyperbolic response from an object crossed at 90 degrees, you can use the hyperbola fitting tool to extract a good average GPR velocity for the site, and you can enter that into the velocity field. Regarding the other processes here, so you can see there's a bunch of processes that are grayed out. I've talked about these processes in, in previous webinar, in my previous webinar on slice view. Uh, specifically, I was slice view for grids. So I won't get into a lot of detail here, but five of the six processes need to be applied to generate depth slices. The sixth is the background subtraction. We'll talk about this option in a few minutes. For now, let's just process the data with using the auto setting. So these are all automatically default. The next thing we're going to, the next setting we have to uh, set is the gain. Gain is about amplifying the weaker signals at depth, so they are visible in the depth slices. Let's start with auto. So I'm just going to use the auto gain. And we'll come back to this one after we see what the first set of depth slices look like. The next set, uh, next section is the slice parameters. Select your favorite color palette from the drop down list. Mine happens to be the default one, which is jet, the red blue default color, and I'm going to stick with that. Other parameters, or the other parameters, the, the slice thickness, the overlap, and the maximum depth, all default based on the antenna frequency and the depth of the data. So in most cases, just go with auto. The last setting down at the bottom here is how the data is interpolated. The main setting is the neighborhood radius, which you can see grayed out here, which is how far the data is interpolated from the GPR line. In ideal data collection in an area, each pass of the GPR system should be an antenna length apart. For example, a 250 megahertz antenna is about 25 centimeters long. So ideally, the GPR survey should have lines about 25 centimeters apart, and the neighborhood radius should be also set to that value of 25 centimeters. In this case, it defaults to medium, and you can see we got low, medium, and high in advance. So if we, if we had the medium setting, uh, that interpolation distance is actually uh, 50 centimeters. So we're going to click it on high, to set it at 25 centimeters, which is appropriate for the data that we've collected. Okay. Actually, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with the default, just to show you that you can pretty much get away with all the defaults in this and get stuff on the screen. The other setting in here is the pixel width. And the pixel width is the physical size of the smallest pixel in the depth slice. This value is typically a quarter to maybe one-tenth of the neighborhood radius. The smaller this value, the longer the depth slices take to generate. So once all the slice view lines parameters are set, I can click on the process button at the bottom and generate the depth slices. So it's churning through the data and it's going to generate some depth slices here. Now, they're not actually visible in, in map view because I've actually turned them off in the, um, in the layer view here. So I'm going to click it back on, and we're going to look at Gulf Green. So there's Gulf Green. There's the Gulf Green data set. And the one thing you notice, and what I can do is there's a slider bar here, so I can slide up and down, and we can see, we can see some data here as we slice down through. So one thing I might want to do is make my depth slices uh, a little less cluttered is to turn off the lines here. So in the line, in the layer view window, I'm going to turn off the actual lines so we can't we don't see those, actually the GPS lines. So there, now there's the pure depth slice. I'm going to slice down through. Okay. So it just makes it a little less cluttered when I turn off the GPS line that's on there. Now, of course, you're going to notice that 
there are there are two things that I noticed right away with my depth slice. One, there's big holes in the data. So we want to close those up. And to do that, we have to increase the interpolation distance. Also, when I slice down, the deeper line, the deeper depth slices are showing me hints of objects, but they're not gained enough. They're, they're kind of weak. So I want to increase the gain. So let's do those two things right now. I can make a new uh, set of depth slices with a new name by selecting slice view lines again. But really, I just want to modify a few of the settings of the, of the depth slices I already have. So rather than creating a new one, I'm just going to modify the one I currently have. And I can do that by going over to Layer View, and I can right-click on my current depth slice. And you'll see a little menu comes up, and one of the options is Delete, which does what it says. And the other is Settings, which is the one I want. So when I go into Settings, I'm back into this window where I was before. And so now the two things that I want to modify are the interpolation distance and the gain. So when I go to the interpolation, I see that um, it is actually 25 centimeters. I wanted to make it 50. So I'm going to go to medium. And I'm also going to increase the gain. And so let's take the gain. So rather than using the auto gain, which we've found isn't doing a good job automatically gaining the data, I'm going to go to a level gain. And those of you um, who are familiar with our other software, this, this is a gain level that we use in line view and we use it in slice view. So it's a number from 1 to 12 with gradually increasing gain. In this case, I'm going to pick a middle of the range gain. So I'm going to pick a gain of 6. So let's do these two things. Let's reprocess the data. And it's going to warn me when I go to reprocess, it's going to say, this already exists. Do you want to overwrite it? And yes, I do. So it goes through, reprocesses the data with the new settings. And now I've got a new depth slice. And we notice that the holes are smaller. We, got, uh, we might tweak that a little bit more to close those holes right up. But then when I slice down through, now I can see a lot more things when I'm slicing down. And actually, yeah, it's still a little bit short down in these bottom ones. I'm starting to see this sort of uh, tree pattern down below here. But I'd like it to be a bit stronger. So again, I'm going to go back, go into golf green, go into settings. And I'm going to do two things again. I'm going to I'm going to take my um, my interpolation up just about 10 centimeters or so, and to do that I'm actually going to I'm going to go from the default setting and I'm going to go into the advanced setting and I'm going to uh, manually enter, and I think to close up those holes I probably just need to um, I probably just need to increase it about 10 centimeters. So I think 60 centimeters for the neighborhood radius is going to work. And I'm going to take the gain up to, let's go to 9, and let's reprocess the data. Again, it warns me. Come back around. And here we go. Okay, so we see most of the holes have been closed up, which is good. And now when I depth slice, yes, definitely I see strong values. And when I slice down, there's what I want to see. There's, uh, there's the interesting data down below there. So now when we slice down, we can see deeper targets are displayed much better. Now we are at the point where we can stop thinking about processing the data and doing what we are really paid to do, and that is interpret the data. So we see a dendritic pattern or this kind of tree pattern of, a str of strong GPR reflectors about half a meter down. And I can tell this by the, um, by the slider bar in the bottom here or on the side. So when I get down to about 50 centimeters, 55 centimeters, that's where I start to see these strong reflectors. And so I look at this and I interpret the data saying, okay, this is data collected on a golf green. So what am I expecting? Well, I'm probably expecting a drainage pattern. So my interpretation is that this is the plastic drainage pipes under the green, which is definitely useful information if my client needs to do some, do some maintenance on the golf green. Now, I want to pick up the conversation from earlier about the background subtraction filter process. We use the default value of zero. So if I bring this um, menu back up, we use the default process of zero, which, which will actually remove any flat-lying reflectors that are constant across the whole GPR line. 
Now, this is actually pretty rare, rare for a reflector to be present on every trace across a whole GPR line. For example, if I, uh, let me come out of here for a second. If I slice down to about 20 centimeters here, I want you to notice something, 15, 20 centimeters, right in this range in here, we see a large area that is all red. This means that there's a strong reflector or there's a, a strong layer at that depth. And if I'm not interested in mapping layers and just want to see small targets, I probably want to filter out this reflector. We see that having the background subtraction filter set to the full length of the GPR line was not very effective. So I'm going to shorten the length of the filter. And I go back into here. And so to get at and change this value, I have to go to the advanced setting under process. And now this is available to, to be changed. So the filter length can be changed. So I'm gonna change the filter length to one meter. So what this means is that any flat line reflector in the data that's about one meter or longer will be filtered out. And let's see the effect of this. So when I process the data again, using all the other settings, all the same settings. It's got a new background subtraction. So now when I slice down to about 20 centimeters, you can see that that whole layer has been filtered out. I no longer see it in my data. Now, one of the effects, and again, I can still see the, um, uh, the drainage pattern down deeper pretty well. I might need to tweak up that gain a little bit. The um, background subtraction seems to reduce the amplitude a little bit, but you can see I can go back and increase the gain. So if you're going to adjust processes, so if you're in this window and you're trying to decide what to do, um, most of the time you're gonna use auto, but if you do wander into the advanced, my recommendation is to not touch any of these except for the background subtraction. And with background subtraction, generally play with values from maybe 10 meters down to about half a meter. It's a good starting point, uh, but, be, but be careful with background subtraction because the purpose of any filter is to remove data. And the last thing you want to do is remove the targets that you're interested in. Okay, let's look at another survey area over the same golf green. But this one was collected with a high accuracy GPS, but in a different pattern. Okay, so in this one, you can actually see that the, um, let me turn off the slice, you can see the pattern. So it's a spiral. So it's not exactly a typical pattern to collect GPR data. But on a golf green, it probably makes sense to collect data like this. So let me look at the, I've already done this before. Let's look at the depth slices we have. So, so this one's looking fairly promising, but let's, let's modify this one and see what we get here. So again, we're going to use auto. We're, we know that we probably need a fairly high gain. We'll use nine like we did before. We'll use our neighborhood radius of about 60 centimeters from before, and we'll process the data. And let's have a look. So when we slice down, same sort of thing, we slice down through. Now, actually, this is getting overgained. The deeper slices are overgained. There's way too much red here. So I'm going to go back in and decide that, you know what, nine was too high. So let's go back down to six, reprocess the data. And let's make sure those deeper depth slices are looking okay. Yeah, that, that's not bad. I might tweak it a little bit lower, but generally we can see the targets that we're after. So remember, when you're happy with the depth slice image and you want to include it in your report, just press this button up here, the Save View button. This will include it in the GPR summary report in PDF format under the tools report, under this menu here, if we're going under tools and report. This will include it in the GPR summary report. Again, I talked about how reports are generated in the webinars I did on utility locating and concrete scanning. So refer to those webinars for more details about reports. 
Okay, I want to move to the second feature. So we've looked at slice view lines. Uh, I want to move to the second feature, which is background images. And so, so what this is, is adding a background image to the map view window. So showing GPR lines and grids and depth slices and interpretations in the context of where the data was collected is a very powerful visual, not only to help you with understanding your data, but also for the consumers of your data, that is your customers, your supervisor, or your colleagues. Echo Project version 5 now has the ability to add an image, any graphics file, behind your data in the map view window. Let me show you a few examples that show the power of this feature. First, I still have the golf green data on here. So let's add an image to uh, the golf green data. So I do that by going to Tools, and way at the bottom of the list here is Add Background Image to Map View. Open up this. Now, a dialog opens. Right on top, you can navigate to the image and select it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to browse in here. I'm going to find the image, uh, an image that I, I took from Google Earth a little earlier. It's called Golf Green, and it's a JPEG. I'm going to open that one up. Now, you'll notice here in this dialog, there's actually four ways to position the image in Map View. But for now, I'm just going to do the easiest one, which is manually positioning it. Positioning it. So I'm going to hit OK. And the image is, is now in behind. So I'm going to reduce this, change this. So there is that image in behind here. So now I'm going to turn off the depth slice so I can see a little bit better. So there's the image in behind. And I'm going to zoom out. All right, so if you need to enlarge the image larger than the current map view window, you, I, I use the zoom out button so that I could uh, get more real estate here to work with. Now, to enlarge the image, keeping the aspect ratio, or in other words, not distorting it, use the yellow triangular handles on the top right and bottom left. So I can grab that, click and drag it, and change the size of the image. I can also, uh, I can move the image around by clicking and dragging it. So I can do this to simply drag it around on the screen. Or if you want, you can click on this little uh, symbol in the bottom corner and do the same thing. As long as you click and drag, you can move it around. And I'm going to need this a little bit larger because I'm trying to match it to the size of the green in the photo. And I might actually zoom out a little bit more so that I can get that size. And so this looks like pretty reasonable where it was collected, maybe just a little bit smaller. So it's probably collected somewhere around there. Now, the last feature on here is there's actually a rotation tool. So if I click and drag on this, I can take my image and I can rotate it around. So if you want to put it in proper perspective, maybe it's like this, we can go ahead and do that. Now, if you do want to distort the image vertically or horizontally, that's where these blue triangles come in. So if you grab an edge and move it, you can distort it in that direction. So once you're happy with the size and the position, of the background image, you can lock it in place by clicking anywhere in the map view window outside of the image. So when I click here, now that image is locked in place. So what I want you to notice is that over here in the layer view window, there's now a new element that's in here called the background image. And it's got a checkbox. So I can, I can check it to see it, or I can uncheck it to not see it. Okay, now if I turn my depth slice back on, so there you go. So there's my depth slice superimposed on the background image there. And again, I can still slice through the data, get the images I want, save them, and put them in my report. So let's look at another example of adding a background image. I'm going to open a new file here. So in this data set, there are four four by four foot grids collected on a concrete floor. And so when I slice down through, you can see there's a layer of rebar. There's a conduit that's running through. 
So these were collected, these four separate grids were collected and, and put together into one larger image here. So I'm going to add some background images to show where this GPR data was collected for, uh, to put in the report for my client. So again, I go to, I think what I'm going to do is minimize this window here so I get a bit more room for uh, the map view window. And again, to add a background image, I go to Tools, Add Background Image to Map View. And now, this time, rather than positioning the image manually, I'm going to use the Project Coordinate System. So I'm going to check the Advanced button, and then that enables all this. And so my choice of coordinate systems are Project Coordinates, which are the XY coordinates, uh, GPS coordinates, latitude, longitude, or GPS done with UTM. So I'm actually going to pick the um, I'm going to pick the project coordinate system. I'm not going to be showing any examples of lat long or UTM, but it follows the same pattern that I'm I'm going to show you right now. So right now I'm going to say, okay, the bottom corner of the image that I'm bringing in, I want to put it at minus 28. X equals minus 28, and Y equals minus 25. And the upper right corner, I want to be at X equals 53, and Y equals 25. And when I hit OK, it's brought that image in. Actually, that is the wrong image. <laughs> Uh, I think I picked the wrong image. Hold on one sec. Let me go to Tools, Image, Browse for this again. I did want to pick this one. Yes. Uh, one here. Okay, my numbers have stayed, so that's good. And let me show that. Okay, good. Now, this is what I want. So what I'm actually putting in here is the as-built drawing. So I've superimposed my data on the as-built drawing for uh, the structure. And so again, this might be a very useful way of presenting the data to your client. Right. I want to add another image while I'm in here. Uh, again, go to Tools, add a background image. And this time, I'm going to pick this one. OK, and I'm just going to manually place this one. So I turn off Advanced and hit OK. And so here is a photograph. And let me just turn off the um, step slice for a second. So here's the photograph I'm actually uh, want to place in here. And I didn't get a chance to edit it. So I'm going to right click on it. And so in here, I can change the settings. No, not as built. I want to change this one. OK, so I want to take this, and I'm going to make it smaller. And I'm going to superimpose that in. So let me zoom out and have a look. And let me put the data back on here. So there's the data. There's a photograph of somebody actually pointing out something in the data. So you can actually put images on images. And again, if you want to show one or the other or both, uh, that's controlled under the layer view. So if I turn off the as built, in layer view, that image disappears. If I turn off the photograph I just put in there, that image disappears. Or you can have both of them uh, at the same time. So if you think about it, the ability to add background images opens many possibilities to enhance the display of your data and help with data interpretation. That's the other side of it as well. OK, I'm going to the third uh, feature that I want to talk about today, which is uh, what we call 2D line positioning. And so I'm going to open up a new data set here. And that's uh, this one here. OK. Now, what I want you to notice is that uh, there's no map view window. There's no map view window here. So, and that's because we have, if you look over here in Project Explorer, there are 28 GPR lines that were collected, but none of them were collected with GPS. So we don't know the position of any of these lines with respect to one another. 
And therefore, we cannot show them in Matthew. And so we have a new tool called 2D Line Positioning. And that's a tool that allows you to position GPR lines in MapView. And if I do that, it might not work out. There we go. So um, this is, there can be very simple ways of positioning lines out in the field. And one of them is a simple tape measure, marking the X and Y start and the X and Y end positions of every line that you collect. And that's, a, that's a, obviously a very simple way of, of doing that. And as I say, for many GPR surveys, especially low frequency surveys, extreme accuracy of the position of each line is, is really not necessary. Often, even using a few tape measures or landmarks to roughly position lines is all you really need. So I'd like to show you how the 2D line positioning tool works on, on this data set. But with 28 lines, I'm not going to spend the time here uh, to, to position all 28 of them. Instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up a file where I've already positioned 22 of them. And then I'm going to position the last ones here and show you how that's done. So here you see that lines 1 to 22 appear in map view. And you can see that they were collected in fairly randomly and with a mix of lengths and directions. And this is the reality when collecting GPR data in challenging areas around rocks and vegetation. You collect lines where you can. So to add positioning to the next line, so for line 23, um, which is not in map view yet, uh, I'm going to select the line, and then I'm going to go to the Tools menu, and I'm going to select Line Positioning. And what I'm doing is I'm adding line positioning to line 23. So this dialog box opens up. And again, I can add those positions based on uh, the project coordinate space, x, y, the global coordinate space, like lab, latitude, longitude, or UTM. So I'm, again, I'm, I'm still working in project space. I'm not working in global uh, coordinate system. So I'm just going to work with X, Y's here. And from the field notes, and that's where this information is coming from, somebody in the field took the information that, OK, line 23 started at a position of minus 0.4 X and 4.9 Y. And it ended, so the second point, was 11.8 and 5.2. And I hit OK. And you see that that line appears. So now I'm going to add the next line, line 24. And I'm going to do a bit of a shortcut here to get to the 2D line position. If I right click on line 24, I can go to, in the submenu, I can go to position relationship. Then I can go to line positioning. It's the same thing as going to the Tools menu and going to Line Positioning. We go to Add. And on this particular line, the position was 0 0.06. So the X and Y position at the start of the line was 0 0.06 and 4.5. And it ended at 12.9 and 4.9. Okay, so now that line appears. And let me do another one here. Let me just skip and do, I'm going to do line 26. And again, position relationship, line positioning, add. And line 26 started at 0.04 and 2.1 and then it ended at 9.4 and 2.6. Hopefully you get the idea. So now there's that line in there. So now, now that I have all the lines positioned the way I want, I want to show you the benefits of doing this. I can now use the slice view lines to generate depth slices from these, uh, from these data lines. Now the first thing I have to do is make sure that I include all the lines in my depth slice. 
The depth slicing we did earlier was based on one line. You remember the spiral? So somebody walked in a spiral or they walked back and forth in kind of a pseudo grid. But it was all done in one line. In this particular case, this was done in 20 some odd lines. And so I'm going to include them all. I know some of them aren't positioned. And I'm going to make sure I get those ones that aren't positioned because I'm, uh, let's see, I don't think we positioned 27 or 28. And 25, okay, 24 is in there. So we did 23, 24, and 26. So they're all in there. So, okay, so these are the lines. So in Project Explorer, I check all the lines that I'm going to include in my depth slice. And then I go to Slice View Lines, and I'm back at this menu that I've seen before. And let's just see. What I'm going to do is I'm going to show the depth slice. There we go. So depth slice here, and now when I slice down through, and again, this is, I should have pointed out, this is low, much lower frequency data. This is 100 megahertz data, so uh, much longer wavelengths, much deeper, this sort of thing. And so we're looking much deeper in, in here. So when I slice down, you can actually see we get some red spots, and then as I get down, it it's a bit quieter, and then around about six meters or so, I start to see a big red spot, and it gets larger and larger and larger. And so this is a beautiful example of depth slicing through some geologic data. So in this example, the data was collected at an old limestone quarry not too far from our office. Uh, the high amplitude reflector is a cave inside the rock. And if you actually look at this line here um, in the line preview, you can see this strong reflector in here. And that's actually the top of a cave. Um, here you see a better view of it here. And so that's the top of the cave. And when we slice into that, it becomes this big red spot right in the center. So we can get a sense of the size and aerial extent of that cave. So the purpose of the, the 2D line positioning is to position, obviously, your lines and, and put them exactly where you need to put them so that you can show them in map view. And what that means is if you have a handheld GPS out in the field and you record the GPS at the start and end of each line, you can use that information to position the lines in your survey. But often, even a sketch map, even a field sketch map with the rough position and direction of each line is all you need. With that in mind, I want to show you an idea that combines adding a background image and the 2D line positioning. So I'm going, going to add a background image. And this image is going to be sketch map. I'm just going to manually. Okay, so I make this a bit larger, and you can see that we actually have, let me turn off the, the lines here. So here's my sketch map. And I literally could go in here, get the sketch map about the correct size, and then I could start adding the position of each line in here. So I could use the, the XY coordinate space. I could go to position of the start of line one, and you can see in the bottom edge we got an XY coordinate that's down here. And then I can get the XY coordinate of the end of the line, and I can superimpose it in there. So I'm not going to do that on this case. But what I want you to realize is that this is a very simple way of positioning your, your data from a sketch map. And what I, I hope that you see the possibilities of what can be done with uh, when you combine uh, the background image with the 2D line position. OK, fourth thing I want to talk about today is, is 3D preview. And in version four of Echo Project that we, um, we released last year, we introduced a type of grid display uh, that we've been using with our Conquest product uh, since the early 2000s. And let me go back and show you an example of this. So if I Okay, so here's the data set that you, you saw earlier with the four grids. I'm going to select one of the grids here, and I'm going to put it in what is called 3D preview display. 
And to do that, I have to highlight it here in Project Explorer. And then I go up to Window on the menu, and I select the Open 3D Preview. And a new window opens up. And I'm running out of real estate a bit, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to minimize these ones, and I'm going to increase the size of this one. So this is what we call 3D Preview. And if you've never seen this type of display before, it's like looking at the top and two sides of a cube. The current depth slice is on the top left. That's this blue area. And when I slice down through, now you can see things that look more like concrete. Okay, yeah, so rebar in here. So the current depth slice is here at the top left. The two grid lines are displayed on the right-hand side and the bottom. And on the depth slice, there are two cursor lines, vertical and horizontal cursor line. And these red lines correspond to these cross-sectional lines on the, on the right side and the bottom. Okay. So wherever I click on the depth slice, the two crosshairs will update to the two closest grid lines and display them for me. I can also use the left, right, up and down arrow keys on my keyboard to move between lines. Here you can see I'm moving the horizontal line one at a time. And if I switch to the other arrow, I can move the other image. It can scroll through the vertical image there. So on the right side of the window, as I mentioned, there's this slider bar. So I can slide up and down through the depth slices. Now what I want you to notice is on the cross-sectional images, on these lines, there are two red lines in here. And the two red lines correspond to the depth range or the thickness of the current slice. So for example, when I'm at this level here, this depth slice image is all the data between these two red lines, but on all the cross sections. In other words, the depth slice image consists of all the GPR data between the two red lines. And we can see that when the two red lines start to intersect with an object, we start to see it. So for example, if I move the two red lines up shallow, there's not a lot going on in the depth slice. And we can tell that when we look at the cross sections, there's not a lot going on between these two red lines. But as the two red lines move down and I, I start to intersect with the rebar, we start to see the rebar pattern in the depth slice. And when I get those two red lines right on the rebar, we can see the entire rebar pattern. So once you understand what you're looking at, it's a very powerful way of looking at large volumes of GPR data quickly and finding the main targets and features of interest. Now, in Echo Project version 5, we've now extended the 3D preview display to any GPR grid, not just Conquest grids. So let's look at a, a, uh, a grid that was collected for utility locator. So same thing, and so I'm going to, again, I'm going to change the view to I'll click here and then go to Window, 3D Preview. And I'll minimize these and make this larger. So now this is a larger scale. So the last one was a four foot by four foot grid. Now we're looking at something that's about six meters by six meters. So about 20 feet by 20 feet. So a much larger grid done with a lower frequency system, probably a 250 megahertz. And, um, and so now we see the two red lines on both the cross sections. And when I slice down, when those two red lines start to intersect the hyperbola on the right hand side, we start to see it. And there, so the two red lines are, are intersecting this hyperbola. And in the plan map image, we can see that we've got a linear feature. So presumably a, a utility of some sort. But we know from the plan map, we know from the depth slice that it goes right across the section um, horizontally in this case. So if I move from line to line using the arrow keys, 
I know that hyperbola is going to pretty much stay in space, stay in the same place and not move. Now, if I slice down deeper, you can see that there are other hyperbolas down here deeper. So if I slice down a little bit more, we go past that first utility, and then we start to pick up two more utilities. And you can see that I'm slicing through this hyperbola on the right. I'm also slicing through this hyperbola on the bottom. And you can actually see that this looks like some sort of T-junction, where we've got one utility coming across this way, another utility coming across this way, and forming a T-pattern. So very powerful way of looking at your data because you see both the cross-sectional image, two cross-sectional images, and the depth slice at the same time. So you can use both of them to work together to understand your data better. Now, one more example, and this is for the geotypes in my audience. So let's open up uh, some geologic data here. And this is a very large scale grid. This is done with 100 megahertz data. And again, so I'm gonna open up the 3D preview window. And a couple things to say here. Now, first of all, uh, you'll notice the scale on this. So this was about 87 meters by 48 meters. So a much larger area, done with 100 megahertz. Now, unfortunately, it was only collected, lines were only collected in one direction. So the lower image here is not visible. I'm only looking at lines in the one direction. But it's still a really cool way of looking at your data. And so if I, as I slice down through, you can see that I've got this kind of, um, there's this, I think the term is a swale. I've got this kind of this low spot that runs through the data that I can see in this cross-sectional view. And if we look at it in plan map, you can see that it actually runs across the entire area, uh, about 48 meters or so. And then when I slice down further, you got a good eye here, you can start to see there's four set beds in here. So we can see some dipping reflectors from four set beds, and we can actually see those beautifully in the depth slice image. So here you can see, so you get the direction, you get sort of the strike direction of of that four set bedding. And so as I slice down, here's here's the probably the best view down here. So I'm down about three and a half, four meters or so. And we can see the um, sort of the crests of, of these four sets. So at this point I'm going to put a plug in because I am looking for a large low frequency grid. Ideally I would like a 100 by 100 meter grid collected with 100 megahertz antennas in an area where you can see 10 plus meters. And if you have something like this or you're willing to go out and collect some, please contact me and let me know. Um, we, I don't see enough geologic data um, over the last little while, so I, I'd like to get more of that. And uh, certainly we would like to show that in our, um, on our website and in, uh, in our case studies. Okay, the next thing I want to talk about is, this is the fifth thing. Um, this is flags and polyline and turfs in map view. And so there's another new feature available in line preview. And I'm going to open up a new data set here. And we're going from 100 megahertz to 1,000 megahertz. So this data set was collected with the Smart Chariot. And so it's on, it was collected with the Smart Chariot. It was towed and all right, so I'm going to, if I turn off, it's already had a background image superimposed on it, uh, but if I turn that off, you can see the data a bit better. And you can see interpretations have already been added. So point interpretations, that's these blue dots, have already been added to the data. So I'm going to actually turn those off by going under the interpretations under in the layer view window. And I'm going to turn off the point interpretation so uh, they're not visible. Okay, so now we can see the path. And if we look at the data, so I'm going to click on line 11 so it appears in, in the line preview over here. And I want you to note that this particular line, now it's appeared in red in map view. You can see this is quite a long line. And if we look at the scale here, this is about 8,000 feet long. And, but one thing you notice, even at this, this large scale, is that there seems to be an area from about 4,200 feet or so 
to about 6,200 feet, where there appears to be a much shallow, uh, shallower reflector compared with everywhere else. And so I'm probably interested in knowing what's the context of that? Why, wh you know, what area is it on my survey where I have this shallow reflector? So one thing I can do is in, in the line preview, I can right click. And when I right click, it'll say show in map view. And when I click on that, a little flag appears to show you that location in, in map view. And so what we see is that, oh, wait a minute, this, this area with the shallower reflector is actually off the road. And if I turn the background image back on, we can see that, yeah, this main, main part of the survey was collected on a road, but they actually veered off and they went into this parking lot and did a bit of a survey and then came back out. And so what I can see from that is that it looks like maybe the... Um, Maybe there's a layer in the parking lot that's much shallower than anywhere else. So being able to right click anywhere on the image, anywhere on the, uh, the line image, and it, a, a flag will appear in map view. So that's a powerful way of, of, um, of looking at your interpretation or helping you with your interpretation. So another way of showing this is to add a polyline interpretation to the reflectors and to look at the pattern in map view. So to add interpretations, I first need to open the GPR line in line view. So I'm going to double click on that, open it up in line view. So here it is. You see my, my interpretations from earlier. The uh, point interpretations are on there. Um, but in this case, I want to add some new interpretations. Now, the toolbar on the bottom here with the eyes is the interpretation module that allows the user to add interpretations to the GPR line. Our symbol for interpretations is an eyeball. And because interpretations are things that you see or you observe in the data. We do not actually, we haven't actually done a webinar on using the interpretation module. So this will give you a bit of a sneak peek if you've never seen it before. The first thing I'm going to do is create a new interpretation by clicking on the shiny new eyeball on the interpretation toolbar. And to speed things up here, I'm just going to pick a template. I'm going to pick the horizon template. And I'm going to give it a name. And this one I'm going to call uh, deep layer. So my deep layer, and right now the color is blue. I don't want it to be blue. I'm going to make it green. So my deep layer interpretation is going to be a green line, and I hit OK. And now what I'm going to do is, I'm not going to do this in a lot of detail, but I'm going to draw a line across where the deeper layer is. And I'm doing a pretty poor job at this, but you get the idea. So there's a green line that corresponds to where the deeper layer is. Now I'm going to go back in. I'm going to create a new interpretation. Another, this is also going to be horizon, and this one's going to be shallow. I'm going to call this shallow layer. And shallow layer, I don't want it to be green. I want this one to be red. So change the color, hit OK. And this time, I'm only going to draw shallow layer where I see this shallow layer. And I'm not doing a great job finding, you know, going exactly right along the top of it, because I just want to show the concept here. So when I come out of line view, so I've added my interpretations, I'm done. I come out of line view, and my interpretation, my line interpretations are now going to be visible in map view. Okay, so here we go. And what we suspected is confirmed. The, the deeper layer is everywhere, uh, but the shallow layer only occurs in the parking lot. And so, you know, that helps with our interpretation. We can quickly see from above the context of the data. And so now, so the new feature here is being able to look at polyline interpretations in map view. So that's a new thing for us. And um, hopefully a new addition that's, that's useful for our interpretations. All right. Um, I've been doing this the whole time. I've, 
layer view, the layer view window has changed a lot since our last version. We have a lot of new things in here. And, and the purpose of layer view is to turn things on or off so they appear or don't appear in the map view and the, um, the line preview windows. So for example, I've got interpretations on here. I can turn them off. If I go in under the interpretations options, I can turn off polylines. I can turn off the GPS lines. I can turn off the flags added in the field. Um, I can turn off the background image. And you see, when I turn everything off, then map view closes. So when I start turning stuff back on again, then it reappears. So it gives you the ability to turn on the elements that you want to see and save the image for your report or, or this sort of thing. So, and I think you saw earlier when I, did, um, when I did depth slices that I could turn depth slices on or off. In this particular example, I don't have any depth slices, but I think you saw it in the earlier one. And that's all controlled by this layer view window. Okay, the last feature that I would like to talk today about is CMP analysis. And I saw that a bunch of you are interested in this, so I'm happy to see that. So uh, let's have a quick discussion about that. And let me jump to my um, PowerPoint here for a second, because um, okay, a CMP survey is a common midpoint survey. It involves collecting data while separating the transmitter and receiving antennas wider and wider apart. It requires bi-static antennas like the Pulse Echo system has. A CMP cannot be collected with any of our other systems such as Noggin, Conquest, or LMX. The purpose of a CMP survey is to determine the GPR velocity information of the subsurface. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about CMP theory. My purpose today is to show people who are already familiar with CMP surveys how to analyze their CMP data using Echo Project 5. So this shows you the concept. So we're collecting data at different separations and that and collecting what's called a CMP survey. So now when I jump back, I'm going to jump back to Echo Project here. And I'm going to open a data file that includes CMP. So here's, here's a CMP file here. Okay, I'm going to close that. It's not a grid at all. Here's a CMP file that we're looking at uh, here. OK, so when we want to process this, what I do is I select the file name. And then I go in under View and CMP Analysis. I click on CMP analysis and a new window opens up. Now let's talk about this for a minute. The plot on the right is the CMP data. Notice that the horizontal scale is the antenna separation. In this example, the antennas started about a meter apart and they finished about 25 meters apart. The reflectors down below here curve downward as the antennas get further apart. The shape of the curve is dependent on the velocity of all the material above the reflector. And CMP analysis is about determining the velocities from these curves. So the CMP analysis parameters are the ones inside this box here on the left-hand side. CMP analysis, you can see there's a bunch of parameters in here. They include things like the start trace, the end trace, the velocity range. The defaults are to use all the traces and all the velocities up to the speed of light, which is, as everyone knows, 0.3 meters per nanosecond. Now, the processes above and the one above and the three processes below, these are uh, processes that can be applied before and after the CMP analysis. And in general, I suggest you go with the default settings. About the only process that you want to modify is maybe the pre-game. If your, if your cross-section, if your CMP reflectors are quite strong, then you probably don't need to pre-game them. And that's what this SET, SE2, SEC2 auto is all about. It adds a pre-game to the data. So I'm going to actually uncheck that because my data is strong enough that I don't think I need a pre-game. 
So now we're all set, we can hit preview. And when we hit preview, now the section changes from the CMP data to the process CMP data. I want you to notice that the horizontal axis is now a velocity scale from 0.1 to point, 0 0.01 to 0 0.3 meters per nanosecond. Now we see a bright spot. We see a bright, bright spot at about 0 .0, 0 0.13 or so meters per nanosecond. And if we look closely, we can see that there's hints of other blobs down here below, uh, but there's not enough gain. So what we want to do is we want to increase the post gain value called constant gain. And we saw here that five wasn't enough. So let's increase to 10 and hit preview. Okay, 10 is doing a bit better, but they're still not quite bright enough. So I'm going to go to 30 and see what we get. Preview. There, that's what I want. I want those spots to be red dots so I can really see them. And what I get from this, what this tells me, is that the average velocity of the material above these reflectors is about 0 0.08 meters per nanosecond. So now I can use that value for more, uh, more accuracy on my depth scale, or I can even use that value to extract the water content of the soil in this area. So I'd also like to point out that this, um, this CMP analysis, also called semblance analysis, is also available as a process in the processing module. So when you click on the process button here, you'll notice um, this dialog opens up that has all different processing steps. And one of the new ones under operation is the CMP slash war analysis. So if you would rather do your own pre and post CMP analysis processing, or if you have many CMP files to process at once, you can do that using the processing module. So that completes today's webinar. Uh, if you need to go, I thank you for attending and I'd say have a great day.